Welcome everyone. First of all, let me give you a sincere apology for our delay in starting. If you live in this region, you appreciate what the weather does. And thanks to the fact that several of us are experiencing weather because of the systems, we've had a few challenges this morning, but we're so glad that you're with us. My name is Janice Kambabach. I'm with the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies at the University of the West Indies Cafield Campus. It is indeed my pleasure to have you join us today for this session of the USAID Eastern and Caribbean Regional Climate Summit. I would of course also like to welcome our audience who's watching on the UWI TV's Facebook page. Welcome to everyone. The United States government has demonstrated its renewed commitment to fighting climate change by rejoining the Paris Agreement in January of this year. In the Caribbean, the need for climate action is particularly urgent. Indeed, situations like this morning demonstrate what a little system can do. We therefore recognize the importance of strong partnerships for regional climate action. And therefore, this, these sessions, this symposium has been organized to join forces, not only to share information and best practices, but also to identify challenges so that we can work together and identify solutions. This has been going on for a little while now. This is our seventh of eight webinars that the USAID Eastern and Southern Caribbean Mission has hosted this month. Over the course of the symposium, we've heard from a variety of people who are working to address the climate crisis. This has included climate scientists, youth activists, and policymakers. And we've also heard from many of you in the audience and we're looking forward to doing so again today. Today, we're looking at financing for adaptation and risk reduction, a hot topic, I'm sure. And we're very honored to have Shardafir Shante Moore from the United States Embassy in Trinidad and Tobago, who's going to offer opening remarks. And we're gonna welcome him to the screen very shortly. Once he's finished his remarks, you're going to hear opening remarks from our very distinguished panel, who I will also introduce very shortly. And then we're going to transition into a Q&A and we'll be taking your questions as well. It is my pleasure now to welcome Shardafer Dante Moore from the United States Embassy in Trinidad and Tobago. Over his 20 year foreign service <laughs> career, Dante has served overseas in Kuwait, Qatar, Kosovo, Nicaragua, Afghanistan and Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean. He is responsible for coordinating the embassy's efforts in advancing US policy goals in several areas to strengthen democratic institutions and build partnerships to respond effectively to key challenges affecting the Caribbean and the Western Hemisphere. Mr. Moore, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Colin Young, Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. Dr. Orville Gray, the Green Climate Fund. Mr. Anthony Isaac, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Mr. Crispin de Alvergne, the OES Commission. Mr. Hopeton Peterson, the Caribbean Development Bank. Ms. Kieran St. Omer, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good morning again and please accept my Sincere apologies for the technical difficulties that I experienced early this morning. It is a pleasure for me to open session seven of USAID's Climate Change Symposium and to share some thoughts with our virtual audience participating from across the region, the United States, and even wider afield. Today's two sessions, session seven and session eight, later for 1 p.m., will complete the three weeks of highly informative and interactive events under the symposium. The United States of America, through the Biden-Harris administration, has made tackling climate change a priority. Addressing the climate crisis must be a collective effort. This includes working with regional entities, national governments, and its citizens the private sector, community-based organizations, and the donor community to reduce the onset and impact of climate change. The United States is committed to strengthening climate action through a renewal of our strong alliances in countries across the world. 
The month of June marks the beginning of hurricane season, and already we have seen the formation of storms over the past few weeks. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, is forecasting an active 2021 Atlantic hurricane season, predicting 13 to 20 named storms, including three to five major hurricanes. Six of the top 10 countries most susceptible to natural disasters are in the Caribbean, and 2020 broke the record for the most named storms in Caribbean history at 30 storms, and they exhausted the entire alphabet. The COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted some threats, like the virus or climate change. See no borders and can harm all of us. It is also a lesson in how quickly societies can adapt if needed. When we invest in climate work around the world, it is an opportunity for economic transformation and ultimately an investment in the U.S. and global security. USAID is well positioned to support the Biden Harris administration's bold climate agenda and implementation and implementation of the Paris Agreement. USAID plays a key role by working with countries who are integral partners in this effort to implement climate solutions on the ground globally. In order to address the climate crisis and protect our environment, USAID is working with partners partner countries in our region to protect critical ecosystems, build resilience against the impact of climate change, transition to renewable energy, and promote the flow of capital towards climate positive investment. USAID, for example, has worked to strengthen marine protected areas or MPAs in the Grenadines and to support the establishment of national sustainable finance mechanisms to support the long-term and effective management of MPAs in select countries in the region. USAID is currently strengthening disaster response systems regionally, nationally, and at the community level through a partnership with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, or better known as CEDEMA. Climate and disaster monitoring systems are being built out with the Caribbean Institute for Metrology and Hydrology. At the community level, USAID is partnering with the Inter-American Foundation to build resilience among community-based organizations. In the energy sector, activities under USAID's Caribbean Energy Initiative will start later this year and will focus on improving the resilience of the power sector as well as support the growth of the renewable energy market through the leveraging of private sector investment and expertise. Today's session seven will look at the critical matter of financing for adaptation and mitigation in the region. It will use the experiences gained from USAID's four-year climate change adaptation program, or CCAP, that ended last year as a platform for discussion by key experts in the field. For example, through the efforts of the CCAP initiative countries, including Trinidad and Tobago, these countries benefited from capacity building support to develop proposals to the Green Climate Fund. This resulted in over 54 million in resources coming into the region from the fund to support readiness grants and adaptation projects. In addition, there is a pipeline of over $200 million in projects to be considered for funding from the fund. Section eight, which follows us later today at 1 p.m., will focus on USAID's tools and approaches to climate change globally. This closing session will summarize some of the key highlights from all eight sessions presented over the past three weeks. I am sure you won't want to miss out on the readout. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a shared global crisis that requires collective action. We will all suffer the consequences if we fail, most especially the vulnerable islands that are the essence of the Caribbean. We have a narrow moment to pursue action in order to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of the crisis. Let us all play our part and seize the op this opportunity to protect our environment. Thank you.
Our first up this morning is Dr. Orville Gray, who is the regional manager for the Caribbean at the Green Climate Fund. Of course, if we're having a panel on climate finance, we must have the Green Climate Fund present. Orville is a coastal ecologist and climate change researcher by training. He holds graduate degrees in environmental biology and environmental studies. Orville has 20 years experience in the field of EIA and environmental management in the Caribbean and over 13 years experience in applied climate change. He's experienced at national, regional, and international levels in public and private sectors, as well as academia in environmental management, climate change adaptation, among others. Orville, your opening remarks, please. Good morning, um, Janice. Thank you very much. And thank you to the team at USAID for inviting us. We are happy to be here um, representing the Green Climate Fund. Sorry, my allergies just seem to be kicking in at the wrong moment. Um, but we are, yes, we're we're happy to be here. We're happy to be supporting countries. Um, the Green Climate Fund is the largest climate finance institution, and we are a creature of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And from that perspective, we are here to support developing countries in um, achieving that low carbon and climate resilient environment and economies that we're looking forward to. So we are here, a small regional team. Uh, we're based in Korea with a, con a regional consultant in the Caribbean, but we are here to work with our countries, work with our country partners who we recognize as our nationally designated authorities, work with our regional and national accredited entities to the GCF to program the climate change concerns for the region and build the type of resilience and um, low carbon economies that we want in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, Orville. And next up, we're going to hear from Daniel Kane. He is the Project Development Specialist at the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center and currently a PhD in Economics Candidate at the University of Nottingham. His doctoral research focuses on the estimation and diagnosis of the gravity model of international trade. Daniel's major experiences are in the areas of applied econometrics, international trade, economic research, climate change, project evaluation, and appraisal, and central banking. Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I bring you greetings on behalf of the Executive Director, Dr. Colin Young, and the team here at 5Cs which is located in Belmopan, uh, Belize. I have a few uh, notes here that I would, I, if you don't mind and permit me, I, I would like to, uh, to just deliver. Um, you could hear me, right? I'm hearing you loud and clear. All right, perfect, thank you. It is my distinguished uh, pleasure uh, to deliver these remarks, as I said, on behalf of the Executive Director of the 5Cs and the team here at 5Cs. I, I feel honored to be part of this discussion that is taking place here, where we are able to share ideas on climate financing and how it is we could mobilize financing for climate action in the region. Uh, climate change is one of the most uh, pressing issues for CARICOM member states in the last decade. The damning effects of climate change and the extreme climate conditions are creating serious challenges to the livelihood of peoples and has, in some instance, reversed economic uh, and economic, economic achievement and economic development uh, that has taken place in the region. For example, the water sector is one of the most vulnerable sector in the region. And the fact that the water sector is cross-cutting also uh, causes um, knock-on effects to other sectors uh, in, in our economy. Uh, it is clear uh, that the potential damning effects of climate change has resulted in the need to place climate change at the center of development strategies and plans as we aim to achieve development resilient to climate change. Despite efforts by many CARICOM member states to mainstream climate change into their development strategies and plans, which has generally been successful, 
there is a challenge of accessing sufficient finance for action necessary to build a climate resilient society. CARICOM member states are most burdened by large central government debts and hence limited physical space to fund climate change projects. They are perpetually faced with the unsurmountable task of accessing resources to foster development while at the same time implementing action to address, uh, address and mitigate uh, climate change. The five C's uh, in an effort to fulfill its mandate to coordinate the region's response to climate change is actively training sector specific experts, fostering partnership and developing projects uh, for submission to the GCF and other bilateral and multilateral partners. I am pleased to report uh, that we are seeing some tangible results, but more needs to be done. Uh, the five C's was accredited to the GCF in 2015 uh, as a regional implementing entity. Uh, we are able to submit to the GCF projects of up to uh, $50 million. Uh, they, to complement this accreditation to the GCF, the five C's has set up within its uh, operations a project preparation facility, of which I'm a part. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm a project development specialist. Uh, that unit or that subunit is primarily aimed at supporting member states in the development of projects for submission to the GCF and other bilateral uh, and donor partners. It is against this background that I wish to take this opportunity to reaffirm the Center's commitment to supporting CARICOM member states, bold ambition and leadership in responding to climate change. We look forward to maintaining a close relationship with the governments of the region and remain ready and willing to support sectors and government uh, in their climate change aspirations. It is our hope that this uh, symposium marks the beginning of continuous government-driven inclusive process that foster greater engagement in climate action and unlocking the financing needed uh, for climate action in the region. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Daniel, for your opening remarks. And of course, if we're having a discussion on climate finance, we must also have the Caribbean Development Bank present so next up to offer his opening remarks is Popton Peterson. He's the environmental specialist at the CDB, where he leads the bank's environmental sustainability activities, including climate change resilience and disaster risk management. Previously, Hopton would have served as the sustainable development manager at the Planning Institute of Jamaica. I was instrumental in leading that entity to becoming the first accredited institution to the Adaptation Fund as well as in designing Jamaica's pilot program for climate resilience. Hopkins also led Jamaica's damage and loss assessment working group and has been an adjunct lecturer on environmental management and geography at the UWA Mona campus. Hopton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. And let me say on behalf of the president and management of the bank, I'd like to express our appreciation for inviting us to share a little bit about the, the bank or the work of the bank. First of all, I would like to share some background on the, on the bank. The bank is a multilateral financial institution dedicated to assisting Caribbean nations and dependencies achieve sustainable long-term economic growth and development. The bank comprises 28 members, 19 of which are borrowing member countries and nine non-borrowing member countries. There's some defining features of the bar members. They're all located in the Caribbean. They're characterized by diverse geographies, physical, economic, and cultural, and they have economies largely dependent on climate sensitive sectors such as tourism, agriculture, water, and transportation. The bank's mission seeks to reducing poverty and transforming lives through sustainable, resilient, and inclusive development. The mission is supported by three strategic objectives, namely building social resilience, building economic resilience, and building environmental resilience. We, we like to say at the bank that the first two uh, objectives are largely dependent on 
the third, which is building environmental resilience. And I'll tell you why. Because what has become clear to us is that climate resilience building among BMCs is key to fulfilling the mission and strategic ob objectives due largely to the exposure and vulnerability of BMCs to potential climate, climate impacts. Let me just add that climate-related disasters have resulted in an estimated US 27 billion in loss and damage during the period 2000 to 2017. And this is significant because recurrent disasters undermine economic growth, contribute to high levels of death accumulation, and slow progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of our bar member countries. To further reinforce the point, it has been estimated that the annual losses from hurricanes, loss of tourism revenue, and infrastructure damage could total US 22 billion annually by 2050 and 46 billion by 2000 by 2100 if no action is taken to address the climate challenge in the Caribbean. But viewers, there's a little good news. The CDB has adopted a comprehensive approach to its climate response in helping its borrowing countries manage climate change risks. Some of the actions being put forward by the bank include financing physical and social infrastructure resilience investments, supporting board members in their quest to achieve their national, nationally determined contribution, supporting community-based climate change adaptation and resilience building, and of course, building the capacity of the bank itself, the internal capacity to manage climate change risks. Fittingly, the bank has developed policy frameworks for climate change and disaster risk management. On the screen, you'll see the climate reference to the Climate Resilience Strategy 2019 to 24. It was first developed in 2012 and recently updated, as I said. And it outlines the guiding uh, principles for the bank's operations in developing climate change adaptation and resilience building. The Disaster Risk Management Strategy and Operational Guidelines 2021 aims to, among other things, build long-term disaster resilience and reduce vulnerability, and to promote a more proactive and integrated approach to the disaster risk reduction and climate change work programs of the BMCs. Just to highlight a little bit of the work that the bank has been doing, or the efforts, the fruits of the efforts of the bank in securing climate finance, the bank has already achieved considerable success in supporting countries to scale up climate change action. And so we have been able to secure US for 23.5 million in climate finance. And of course, disbursed to our, our, our countries between 2012 and 2020. The bank has also positioned itself to be a catalyst for rapidly scaling up the flow of climate finance to support climate resilience and low emissions and development in the region by becoming accredited to the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. Now, much of the success in securing climate financing and disaster risk reduction uh, financing has come through multilateral and bilateral partnerships which the bank has, has developed. These are strategic partners is being shown there on the screen. And it's quite a number of, of, of partners, and therefore I've included a category known as others because no one should be left behind. And in addition to, to this, the, the, the key point I wish to make here, though, is that CDB has used these uh, partnerships in a strategic manner to secure financing for national, sectoral, and community-based climate change interventions. And this last one is aimed at targeting the poorest and most vulnerable communities in our bar member countries. But of course, even as we, you know, can claim some successes in climate finance, and the bank continues to encounter significant challenges. These include, for example, the limited concessional resources available to finance more comprehensive interventions, 
the high indebtedness of board member countries, which of course reduces their ability to finance robust capital investment programs. Limited data and information to, to plan interventions, and we we'll speak about this in a, in a very positive way later on. And limited board member country capacity in areas such as you know project proposal preparation and implementation, and inadequate understanding of funding requirements. So or we will will be able to say some things on this later too. However, even with these challenges, the bank will continue to work with its international, regional, and the national partners to implement its climate resilience policies and, and also those of our, our BMCs. To give just a snapshot of our future climate financing F, um, support, for the period 2021 to 2026, it is the bank's intention to continue to support BMC's uh, or the bar member uh, countries' access to climate finance for scaling up adaptation and mitigation investment. We will also strengthen and improve uh, our bar members' disaster risk governance. And finally, and most importantly, the bank has committed to providing 25 to 30 percent of its own resources to manage climate change risks in VMCs. I uh, would close by saying that in spite of the difficulties, the CDB remains committed to championing the cause of climate change finance in the region. I thank you very much. Thank you so very much for that presentation. Really appreciate it, uh, Mr. Peterson from the CDB. And now we're going to move on and hear from Chris Duvet, who is the Program Director for Climate and Disaster Resilience at the OECS Commission based in St. Lucia. For over 15 years, Chris served as a climate change negotiator for St. Lucia, mostly as lead technical negotiator during that time. He would have negotiated or facilitated negotiations on, among other things, capacity building Article 6 of the Convention and Response Measures. Currently, he serves on the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. Crispin, your opening remarks, please. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator, and good day, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here this morning. The Eastern Caribbean, the, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States is an 11 member grouping consisting of independent countries and overseas territories of France and the United Kingdom. The region is on the front line of climate change. Because we are the smaller islands in the Caribbean chain, impacts are often, uh, they often manifest themselves more rapidly. And during the hurricane season, we are the gateway for the westward, westward moving cyclones, which are growing more intense, both in terms of wind speed and rainfall intensity. There is therefore an urgent need on our part to address climate change in a holistic, balanced manner. Climate change adaptation and resilience building remains a priority, along with mitigation in pursuit of low carbon economic development. Indeed, in May 2021, the OECS Council of Ministers Environmental Sustainability endorsed the region's first climate change adaptation strategy and action plan for the period 2021 2026. Now, the NDCs, the National Adaptation Plans, and other plans prepared by our various member states capture both the high ambition of these countries and the high cost of fulfilling these ambitions. Clearly, therefore, climate change is a high and urgent priority. And it is worth noting that studies have shown that the, the financial flows for, for climate, to address climate change, are lower than they are in, in many other regions of the world. Now, OECS member states, both on an individual and collective basis, will continue to pursue climate finance from traditional, regional, and international sources, as these are typically larger and better understood. However, accessing these resources is typically a top-down and state-driven process. There is this experience in the region in working directly with businesses and households, although it is becoming increasingly clear that governments cannot address climate change alone. The OECS is therefore looking to innovative approaches to engage these and other stakeholders. One initiative, is the recently launched Eastern Caribbean Solar Challenge that seeks to address both adaptation and mitigation through collective action by all stakeholders in all OECS member states. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your opening remarks, Mr. Duvet. And now we move on to Mr. Isaac Anthony, who is the CEO of the PERF SPC, formerly the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Mr. Anthony has over 25 years of senior management experience, spanning several areas, including public finance and economic planning. He was instrumental in the establishment of the Caribbean Public Finance Association and served as its first chairman. He's now using his rich experience in public finance, disaster risk financing to promote catastrophe, sorry, catastrophe insurance as a strategy to support fiscal and climate resilience. Mr. Anthony. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and good morning to all. I'm sorry that you're not able to see me, but at least you're able to hear me. Um, as we reflect on uh, financing for adaptation and, and disaster risk, I think it would be prudent um, to speak a bit about CRIF and the work that we've been doing in the area of disaster risk financing, um, both in the Caribbean and Central America. Um, some of you would know that CRIF is actually the world's first multi-country risk pool based on parametric insurance. And, and again, just to remind you that the, the inspiration or maybe the motivation, I would say, for the establishment of the CRIF really came from one major hurricane event called Hurricane Ivan in, in 2004, which you would recall devastated um, several well, countries, but more, more um, notably with Grenada and, and the Cayman Islands, where the losses were put to over 200% of gross domestic product. And this really, this single event, and given the immensity of the losses, really served as a wake up call for the heads of government who decided to approach the World Bank for technical assistance in, des in, in designing and implementing some form of disaster risk financing uh, a mechanism. And that's what really led to the creation of CRIF, which was eventually launched in the year 2007. Um, SCRIF provides parametric insurance uh, to Caribbean, and, and later we added Central American governments. And, and since 2020, that's last year, we were able to launch a product for electric utilities. Essentially, CRIF, formerly the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, operates as a development insurance company. Uh, as the, the services that we provide, are really designed to enhance the overall development prospects of its members. We currently have 24 members. Um, and in fact, I, I should add <laughs> that our latest member only, uh, only joined this week. So that's, that's amazing. Um, and in fact, we will soon be making an announcement of this. But we have 24 members, which include 19 Caribbean countries, four Central American governments, and one Caribbean electric utility company. Um, CRIF offers products not readily available in the traditional insurance market. The parametric products that we provide, in a sense, represent a, a key component in a country's disaster risk financing strategy and are really designed to help pre-finance short-term liquidity, helping um, to close the protection gap, reduce um, budget volatility, and allow countries to respond to their most pressing needs post a disaster, including, of course, the most vulnerable um, in the population. The parametric insurance products, in a sense, um, really are different to traditional indemnity insurance. So unlike the traditional indemnity insurance, which requires uh, uh, underground assessment of losses after an event, which, as you know, could take a, a long time, could take as much as six months or more. The parametric insurance that we provide is really a, a, an insurance contract that makes payments based on the intensity of an event and the amount of loss calculated in a, in a pre-agreed model causing by those events. So this really enables us to be able to know almost immediately what the model losses are. And if you know what the model losses are, then you ought to be able to determine whether or not a policy of a, of a country uh, is triggered. So in a sense, it really represents a cost-effective way to pre-finance short-term liquidity 
to begin the recovery process after a catastrophic event, thereby filling the, the gap between immediate response and long-term redevelopment. Um, currently, CRIF offers five insurance products. And in fact, when we started in 2007, we were able to offer um, coverage for earthquakes and tropical cyclone. We subsequently added excess rainfall. And since then, of course, we've been able to, to introduce a, a product for um, electric utilities. And of course, the one for coast, which are for the fishery sector called coast, which I will, I will address a bit later. CRIF has made 50 payouts, totaling $200 million to 16 member governments. Um, and again, you remember the big year, 2017, um, with Irma and Maria. We, in that year, we made $55 million in payout. And last year, because of tropical cyclones, ETA and IOTA, we were able to make, for Guatemala alone, we were able to make payouts of just of $30.6 million. 62% um, of the payouts for tropical cyclones, um, uh, it's really allocated for tropical cyclones and 28% for, for excess rainfall. Uh, in a sense, that really illustrates um, the, the possible impacts of changing climate that carries uh, increase in both the numbers and severity of hydrometeorological hazards since inception of CRIF in June of 2007. Uh, most of the payouts um, that we make, more than 60%, um, have been used by governments to address immediate post-disaster activities such as providing food, water, uh, shelter, temporary shelter, medicine, etc. And of course, it does also provide a potentially support to help, you know, uh, recovery or, or rebuilding of infrastructure and so on, as we have seen in a number of countries. So in closing, you know, let me take this opportunity to really thank the organizers, you know, for, for allowing me to really to showcase the work of CRIF in the area of, uh, of climate finance and as, as, a, as a development finance entity. I thank you. And I thank you too, Mr. Anthony, for your opening remarks. Helping me bring some gender balance to this panel is Ms. Kiran Sintomer. Ms. Omer is, Saint Omer is the Senior Projects Officer as well as a Financial Institutions Coordinator with the FinTech Working Group and Team Lead Money and Capital Market Development in the Governor's Immediate Office at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Kiran is an experienced capital market professional with 14 years of consolidated regional and international financial market experience. Her primary role currently involves implementing and providing advice on regional financial sector diversification initiatives focused on in the areas of FinTech, which is Dcash, a blockchain-based central bank digital currency pilot. Money and capital market development and sustainable long-term financing for renewable energy development. Looking forward to your opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kumbabach. And um, thank you at uh, all the other attendees. Your contributions have been quite um, insightful and um, also strengthens the need for the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to provide an economy-wide approach to the risk of, to the um, challenges of climate finance and financing risks on the whole when it comes to low carbon um, energy provision in the ECCU. To start off, I'd like to extend the thanks of the Eastern Caribbean um, Central Bank Governor and just an overview in terms of the Central Bank. We are long-standing regulator in the financial system, the primary regulator in the ECCU for the eight member states of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, and that has been since 1983. Uh, ECCB is now seeing a need, especially on the, um, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, and as governments become even more constrained with um, budgets and fiscal space to finance the resilience and the recovery. Most recovery plans pick to 
transition into renewable energy, as well as food safety, um, health, those systemically important sectors, socioeconomic um, sectors are very important and they have been, been vulnerable. The pandemic has demonstrated the vulnerabilities and how it has impacted um, us in the region. We have key sectors literally coming to a halt like tourism and job creation being very negatively impacted. So much so that the growth for 2020 declined by 14% for the ECCU and even higher for on a country by country um, basis. So the ECCU, the ECCB, sorry, definitely sees the need to adopt a more economic wide approach. In a review of all the different initiatives, financing initiatives that have been, been taking place over the last two decades, we know there are almost more than almost 50 initiatives that have been introduced to help with financing climate change given the high risk and the intensity of climate change to the region and how it has led to persistent fiscal imbalances. However, due to a number of factors, the countries in the ECCU, the renewable energy sector and climate change mitigation strategies and adaptation strategies fall short. This goes back to financing. The greening of the financial system is seen as, as a very important aspect in all of this. And climate risk stress testing, as well as <clears throat> capacity, building capacity in those areas within the Eastern Caribbean is also very important. Now, despite all those initiatives, the transition has been slow. The progress to sustainable or to countries even achieving their national determined contributions has been fairly slow with renewable energy penetration less, well, at least most recent estimates indicate about 12.3%. Now, most of our countries have strengthened their targets to um, low carbon energy transition. And we see the renewable energy sector as a very important sector because energy is critical, a critical input to all sectors and industries in the economy. And that in itself has been a huge fiscal burden where countries in the ECC spend approximately $1.2 billion on um, fuel imports over the last six years. This, this in itself displaces funds for more social programs and social infrastructure, because as I said, energy is very critical. With that being said, we have over 20 kilowatts of renewable energy, megawatts, sorry, of renewable energy potential that remains untapped and exploited and it goes back to financing. So the is important, and the speakers before me have explained all the efficiencies, inefficiencies and problems that are impacting the transition and development of the sector. The ECCU sees a need for a very, a more economy-wide approach, a new to that long-standing problem, a new approach by looking at renewable energy. Renewable energy attracts the largest climate finance flows, the largest fraction. And for 2021, it is estimated that 70% of renewable energy, of climate finance flows will be directed at renewable energy. Because of the potential, we see decreasing costs of production also has increased the attractiveness of um, new technologies, the adoption of those technologies. So to accelerate the scale up of renewable energy in the region, we are hoping to improve the system architecture for doing so. This has been the gap in ensuring that the spate of initiatives, the commitments, the pledges actually translate to the large size of investments needed in that sector. So the ECCU is, it will be establishing, one of the key initiatives is the establishment of a renewable energy infrastructure investment facility that we're working on. And with that, it will enable us to leverage very limited public finance and consolidate sources from multilateral agencies to ensure a more efficient flow and sustainable flow of capital, both private, regional, international, and global finance flows are actually flowing into, in the form of foreign direct investments to the ECCU. This has 
this will have a significant impact on several, I mean, the knock-on effects will be huge. When we look at job creation, when we look at, <coughs> sorry, when we look at so many other important sectors of health, tourism, as well as the adaptation of technologies that will enable the creation of new markets in the region. Of course, we see there are three key aspects to doing that. One, legislative frameworks. I've already spoken to the time um, market-based initiatives, financing mechanisms that are needed, which this is where our effort is directed now via the facility. And we're looking at political buy-in for this. We see some of the top-ranked countries um, in terms of attractiveness of renewable energy investments lose their rankings or slip down because of the lack of political buy-in or accommodative policies. So the policy framework is one of the key aspects that we're addressing with that um, renewable energy initiative that we're currently um, engaged in. One of the key aspects of that is to leverage and tap into capital markets, the regional capital markets and international capital markets via innovating financing mechanism. Now, there are blended financing structures that are currently being exploited to deliver on renewable energy projects in the region. For instance, geothermal exploration in St. Lucia, in Dominica, have benefited from some of those deal structures. We need to see a broader proliferation of such. And through the facility, which is also going to leverage the existing initiatives in the region, for instance, we've heard from the CDB, we also are aware of CARICOM and a spate of initiatives and in institutions that they've set up. Through our convening power, the ECCB is hoping to leverage those existing initiatives to boost the momentum for the renewable energy transition that will filter through the economy and reward us in a significant way and help in terms of the recovery that we're currently trying to find a way to finance for the, for the Eastern Caribbean subregion. On that note, I'll end here and say thank you, listeners, for listening. Thank you so very much for your remarks, Ms. Gomer. Thank you to all of the panelists so far for sharing your initial thoughts on these various facets of climate change impacts and how we're trying to respond from a financial point of view. So this is our Q&A time. I am going to start by posing the first question, but I invite our audience, both in the Blue Jeans platform, as well as the UE um, TV Facebook page, to please send us your questions so that I can put to our panel. So I've, they've had these questions and they've been prepped. I am not a lecturer for no reason. I do give my students a little bit of assistance up front. And the first question that I'm going to pose to my panel this morning is, let's look at the role your institutions are playing uh, in helping the regional stakeholders, key stakeholders, especially finance managers in the public sector to respond to climate change risk and impacts over time. So how are you helping to increase regional capacity among key stakeholders so that they can respond to, of course, from a financial perspective, climate change risks and impacts. So perhaps we will start with Colton. You want to kick off on this one? Maybe Kieran, you want to follow? Yeah, I, I could do that. Thanks very much, Janice. And I think it's fair to say that the bank has a good track record of partnering with other multilateral development banks and other development partners to advance its climate action agenda. Uh, in saying this, I can also say that the bank has supported mitigation and energy security and adaptation efforts by leveraging concessional financing for sustainable energy initiatives. Uh, one example of this comes on the day Sustainable Energy Facility, which, in which CDB partnered with the Inter-American Development Bank for a U.S. 71 million facility that is used to provide loans and grants to facilitate growth of renewable energy in the Eastern Caribbean. There's another energy initiative which I want to mention, and this is the Sustainable Energy for the Eastern Caribbean program. And this one, the bank partnered with the European Union 
and the Department for International Development. Well, at the time it was, it's now the Foreign um, Commonwealth and, and, and Development Office, in which this, this grant facility of approximately 26 million is, is used to promote renewable energy and energy efficiency among EMCs in the Eastern Caribbean. Another point I wish to make here is that, yes, just to reiterate a point that the CDB considers concessional, concessional financing as a powerful incentive to its borrowing member countries, which is, uh, you know, used to, to, to encourage these countries to undertake climate action events, investment, sorry. As such, the bank has over the years tried to help its borrowing members to overcome fiscal constraints and weak technical capacity through its strategic partnerships. One such initi initiative or, or partnership uh, came between the European Investment Bank and the Caribbean Development Bank, which allowed for blending of, of, of EIBs, concessional resources, with CDB's market resources in a program referred to as the Climate Action Line of Credit. The result of this is that the borrowing members or borrowing members can secure loan financing at a much cheaper interest rate, you know, due to the blending of, of, the, of, of, of the, the resources. Another advantage is that, it, that the, the program supported, provided grant resources, which allowed CDB to, to give significant technical support to BMCs, while at the same time enhancing the bank's <laughs> own capacity. The bank has also partnered with the Global Climate uh, Fund to implement GCF readiness programs. And these programs enable BMCs to strengthen their institutional capacities and govern governance mechanisms, and also their planning and programming framework towards you know, long-term transformational climate action agenda. And over time, to help them scale up concessionary climate finance for climate investment. Finally, I'd just like to point to some actions which will which will which will evolve in, in, the, in the coming year, because the bank you know will seek to support its borrow members to access climate finance for scaling up climate change adaptation and mitigation investments, including an ambitious work program with the Global Climate Fund. The proposed GCF program will it support development uh, finance institutions in, in Belize, Jamaica, St. Lucia, and St. Lucia to, to develop a program aimed at greening the financial services sector. Also, they support the Water and Sewage Corporation of the Bahamas to develop a GCF project to enhance resilience of its water supply and infrastructure. And finally, the energy sector stakeholders in Barbados, Belize, Guyana and Jamaica to develop GCF programs in the scaling up investment in, the, in distributed energy resources to help decarbonize the sector while enhancing resilience. And finally, and in line with the, with the bank's climate resilience strategy, the bank will continue to leverage its own financial resources and partnerships to attract additional concessional resources in support of BMC's climate investments and associated capacity building institutional initiatives. And I'll stop there, Chair, thanks. Thank you very much. That's quite uh, a significant platform that you're, you're, you're prepping for indeed. Um, does any one of the other panel want, panelists want to also respond to this in terms of capacity building with key financial stakeholders in the sector? Sure, um, Janice, but I can add in that aspect, given our role as the primary leader of um, financial institutions and service providers, um, the ECCB has um, taken quite a few initiatives in the um, recent five years in terms of um, not only with financial stakeholders, but with um, um, ministry officials across the ECCU subregion, where we've developed capacity building in um, smart climate fiscal policy. 
to ensure that that becomes embedded within the um, national policies and across all sectors. Additionally, um, we've also we currently um, have taken on the initiative to have training with, um, for instance, our bank supervision examiners and various banks in terms of climate risk stress testing. We are hoping to expand on that in the coming year or so um, and currently engaging with um, different stakeholders, multilateral agencies, as well as development partners to pilot the greening of the financial system in three key areas in terms of um, <clears throat> green financing and risk management, climate risk management um, systems for the, throughout the ECCU subregion. So we're definitely lo looking to help and add to a very much needed um, area of development for the region. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to switch to the other gentleman on the screen right now and ask another question. This one, I want to focus now on financial instruments because access is an issue. We know we need climate finance, but I'm sure many of my audience today or our audience today is saying, but it's there, we hear it's there, but how do we get access? So let's talk a little bit about financial instruments, especially for vulnerable groups, because let's face it, climate change is going to be a problem for everybody, but especially for those most vulnerable. So I'm going to toss this one out to, to Chris and to, to Orville in terms of how, how are we, you know, developing the right financial institution, in, instruments that, that can help um, enhance access to the finance that is there, but may not be the easiest thing to, you know, get at. Um, you, you, you want to jump first, Crispin? Actually, I will be referring to you um, because uh, yeah, it's given the GCS critical role in this area, but I'd be happy to speak if you don't want to. <laughs> anyway, um, from from our perspective, um, yes, the, the whole issue of vulnerable groups, as, as I indicated earlier um, in, in my opening remarks, historically, the, the whole process of, of leveraging finance from traditional sources is, is a, is a, has been a top-down approach typically. You know, where governments you know, go out and, and, and try to leverage funding from, from, from the, internet, the various international sources or regional sources. And um, in, in, in some instances, it, is, it has not always been built on a need identified, you know, coming, coming from the ground, but rather you know, taking a, a broad overview of what, what the perceived needs are. Um, so I think um, I think we need to start looking to start doing it the other way around, or doing more of you know doing building from the ground up, identifying what the, what the needs are and so on. Now the, the I, I believe also that that um, we probably have to start looking beyond just the traditional approaches. Even, even when we, we we talk to, to people on the ground and understand what, what what's needed. We need to be able to to have funds or, or, or resources sources that we can go to when there are relatively small initiatives, right? You know, that that's communities and you know local organizations and some require. Now, you know, for example, that you know the under the Jeff Small Grants program, there's there's some there's some scope for doing that, you know, up to a certain amount. But I think there's there's a possibility of scaling this up to you know to medium scale, you know, not necessarily you know the, the Four and five or ten and twenty-five million dollar projects, but actually being able to create new portals or new windows to access, you know, like say the one million, the two million that can, you know, that you know, in some cases, even the five hundred thousand that can, that you know, communities, you know, um, regional organizations, um, and municipal councils and authorities can can access. I think that is that is a window perhaps that has not necessarily been targeted, but I think. So at least not sufficiently, but I think with that needs to come the capacity, the capacity to access those resources. Because you know, um, I think a lot of us on you know in this in this group will agree that when you have to go for the big funding, there is you know even when it's expedited, sometimes you are not usually there's a, there's, there's a lot of paperwork to be done. So I think that the level of paperwork for one has to be commensurate to the level of funding being required and recognizing the, the needs and the capacities at the, you know, at, at the, at the levels that, that we're working at. Now, 
certainly from the, from the, the OECS standpoint, we've been working with communities in the Gulf countries, and we've been able to leverage resources, including from Pre Factory, um, you know, and some other some other some other partners to actually do work at a small scale, whether it's mangrove restoration and so on. We've been able to do that, but we've also tried to work with the communities in terms of you know in terms of having to build the capacity to develop projects and to actually seek funding on the on their own where it is available. And we will continue doing that and building on that. But I think there is probably a need for our the, the, our you know the, the funding agencies to start to look at, at that. And I think in addition to that, I think there's also a need for the financial sector. It's something that we've been talking to the financial sector about with partners to start to, to, to build to create facilities where households and, and others and, you know, and other vulnerable people can get resources at you know, even see your community, your credit unions, for example, can provide funding at, at more affordable rates. I know one or two um, institutions in the region have started to do that. I know Capital in St. Lucia, for example, have started to do that, but I think there's scope for much more of that. But the conversation must go on. Thanks for that, Chris. In fact, I'm wondering if perhaps Isaac would like to weigh in on this from the point of view of Chris and as a, a follow on to talk about the whole issue of, of gender and ensuring that we advance gender equality and social inclusion. So Isaac, do you want to weigh in on this issue of, of vulnerable groups and um, instruments? Because I know that um, CRIF does have some, you know, products that maybe you want to share a bit of information with our audience. Uh, absolutely, um, Janice, and thanks again. Uh, very important question. Um, we honestly think that in order to be able to really reach the, the vulnerable groups, it really has to be through microinsurance, um, which again is really targeted individual, but trying to target low income um, and persons who generally have very limited access um, to mainstream insurance services, another means of, of effectively um, coping with, with such risk. Um, you know, those types of products have generally been um, uh, very limited, but I am pleased to say that uh, a greater effort is being made to address this. And I can actually highlight um, a couple of initiatives that CRIF is, is involved in, which will address um, exactly what you're saying. So for example, we have um, two such instruments. Um, the first one is one that was designed uh, specifically for the fishery sector called COAST or the Caribbean Oceans and Aquaculture Sustainability Facility. And that one was actually launched in, 2000, in 2019 in two countries, Grenada and St. Lucia. In fact, I'm actually pleased to say, and perhaps I should really take this opportunity to again, to thank the, the US government. That was really very instrumental in, in the launch of this particular initiative. And they actually provided the initial capital and with the support of the World Bank, we were able to, to get this off the ground. And I should actually say that um, it, it was actually, um, I think it was Secretary of State, um, John Kerry at the time, you know, when he was Secretary of State, you know, who, who really provided a lot of the, the support for this particular initiative and we were able to get it off the ground. And it's no surprise that he's now the, the US Special Presidential Envoy for, for Climate. Um, so yes, so that has done very well for us. We currently have expressed um, extra interest coming from a number of other countries in the Caribbean, about 10 of them. Um, but basically what is COAST? It is really a parametric insurance um, product that is designed to provide quick payouts to support the livelihoods of, of the fisher folk, whether it be the fishermen, the boat boys, the market vendors, many of whom, as you know, are women. Uh, I would say it's a, it's a bit of an, an, a hybrid product. Um, so on the one hand, there is a sovereign parametric side because the government is actually the one purchasing the product, but the ultimate beneficiaries are really going to the individual fisher folk. So in a sense, cost is, a unique, is unique in terms of its payout um, as they have already been channeled through um, the ministries of finance and, and is being made available to the fisher folk within, within 14 days. Um, so in effect, we, we really view COAST as, as highly innovative on the one hand, as it links sovereign level risk insurance with social protection strategies and so on. In fact, 
course actually hits a number of the, um, I would say a, lot, a number of the SDGs, for example, SDG 1, ending all forms of poverty everywhere, SDG 5, the gender equality, SDG 10, reducing inequalities, SDG 14, life underwater, and of course, SDG 13, climate action. There's also another product that we are playing a very key role um, um, in the Caribbean, and that is one called the Livelihood Protection Policy, which is really part of an initiative called the, the um, MCI, the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, um, that was launched some time ago, and with other partners such as the ILO, the ILO Impact Insurance, we've been working towards providing this parametric livelihood protection product to protect the most vulnerable in the population, whether we talk about um, farmers, fishers, vendors, market vendors, uh, street food vendors, day laborers, uh, persons who work uh, in the tourism sector construction, because we know how vulnerable those persons are to the advent of those major um, climate-related hazards. The LPP is really designed to provide quick cash payouts following extreme weather events, uh, specifically high wind and heavy rain. And, and you know, we really do work towards the redesigning the LPP. Um, and in fact, what we will be doing in the coming, in the coming months, because we are just about launching a next phase of the project, we will be looking to propagate the livelihood protection policy. So these are some of the instruments that we are doing, and we are looking to do additional products in the microinsurance. One of the things, for example, that we're looking to do is the uh, introduction of uh, an index-based agricultural insurance, again, targeting specifically the agricultural sector, but making sure that we address all the perils in that sector, whether we talk about um, wind, whether we talk about uh, excess rainfall, um, drought, storm surge, et cetera. So we see that there is huge potential um, for the use of microinsurance in helping to address, I think, the, the needs, or at least in terms of making available um, resources, uh, particularly to the, to the vulnerable groups in, in our society. Thanks so very much for your um, updates on the work of PRIF. And, uh, we do have a question from the audience. This one focuses on the water sector. The one is asked, what aspects of resiliency in the water sector do you believe need the most focus with regard to both planning and financing across the region? So they want to know what aspects of resiliency within the water sector needs the most focus with respect to planning and financing in our region. Who wants to, to tackle this one, focusing on the water sector? Uh, I'm no water sector expert, uh, but it so happens that I spend some time developing water project, uh, water sector projects. Uh, it, it, the answer to that question really is, is has to, to, to take into consideration the, the national context. But if I was to answer that from a, a regional perspective, uh, it is a matter of, of access, quantity. Uh, our climate change models predict uh, reduction in rainfall, particularly across the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, what that means is that uh, islands that depend mainly on rain-fed agriculture, on rainwater for, 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 for domestic purpose and commercial purpose, uh, will be faced uh, with challenges. What that means is then uh, we need to consider issues of storage uh, and, and increased storage capacity. Uh, it, it would be that main thing. But there are other aspects of the water sector that challenges many of the other countries, particularly the energy associated with the production and distribution of water. Barbados is a perfect example of that where they have no, they have limited surface water uh, resources. Their groundwater resources are uh, are what they depend on mainly. And what that means, you need energy to get it from under the ground and you then need energy distributed to the population. Of course, they don't have mountains like we have in Jamaica or in uh, some of the other Eastern Caribbean countries. So they don't have the gravity at their disposal. 
uh, they still need energy to pump that to uh, uh, the businesses and households for, for use. And so energy costs to the utility uh, remains a, a, a big uh, part. And so there presents an opportunity for investment in renewable energy sources to uh, um, produce and distribute water. But that is just one aspect. That is the mitigation aspect of it, one might say. But it also is very critical from a resilience building point of view, because uh, in the aftermath of a hurricane, one of the most critical resource uh, is water, uh, whether it is for healthcare reasons or for domestic purposes, for hygiene related matters, is water. And in some instances, our grids are usually damaged by a hurricane. And if those pumping stations are dependent on, on the grid, then access to water becomes challenging. And in the case of Barbados, that, that is even more devastating. Uh, and as such, uh, putting in renewable energy sources, uh, which are easily uh, you know, up and running after a natural disaster, especially if you're back up, uh, storage of the energy on site uh, allows for there to be resilience building in the water sector. So if I was to uh, put forward two main priorities for the for the water sector is really uh, increasing storage of uh, in, in water resources and of course integrating renewable energy into our water system primarily from the standpoint of resilience building. I could go on and on about other things that needs to be done in this sector, but I'll just... If, if I may jump Thank in. You. Yes. No, no, everybody wants to make a comment. Um, yeah. who, who did I hear first? Arville, I haven't heard from you in a while, so... so <laughs> Arville, Arville. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to jump in on the previous question after a Crispin, but um, I'll, I'll probably just do a little bit on that as well. But from the water sector perspective, to add to what Daniil um, put forward, you know, Building resilience in the, the plants and the infrastructure for water is something that is very vital to us as, you know, um, when we do get a hurricane, the systems tend to go down. But, you know, we, we have to think about, okay, how do we ensure that the infrastructure that is there can survive the onslaught of the hurricane systems that we have? So access to water is, is important, but, you know, having the water there and securing it is one thing, but getting it to those who need it is, is, is a totally different question. So the, the infrastructure and, and building the resilience in the infrastructure is very, very important. That said, we also need to look at, for instance, our um, ecosystems, which is supporting the, 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 the water resources that we have. I mean, without the ecosystems, there's no water. And so you look on the flip side coming, you know, not looking at the hurricane, but then you look on the drought aspect of it. It becomes critical. The Caribbean is is becoming water stressed. Um, you know, I mean, in Jamaica we say land of wood and water. In many of the other small islands, water becomes a, a key theme in either the motto or, or 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 something for the country. But many of us are suffering from degradation of our watersheds. So you know, looking at the um, ecosystem-based adaptation measures that we need to be taking to protect the the, the, the watersheds. To look at, for instance, how we incorporate agriculture with forestry um, in a manner that still can sustain the, the watershed to ensure that the vital water resources is protected is something that we need to look at because in, in protecting it from a natural perspective, you know, we are actually building resilience in the water infrastructure because then we are reducing the, the bulk of sediments that get washed down into rivers uh, uh, and streams. We are reducing the, the amount of water that runs off the surface that can damage infrastructure and, and plants. So that in, in and of itself is an area that additionally needs some focus and we might not have been necessarily paying that attention to it. And just quickly, if I may, just jumping back on the sure. previous question that was raised, you know, from the GCF perspective, we do have a number of financial instruments that we, we have available, loans, equity, guarantees, and grants. Um, traditionally from the public sector, they're gonna come to the GCF with grants. That's what we, we have been seeing. I mean, we do have a combination of the others, but it's primarily from grants. But GCF does have an appetite to de-risk climate smart investments. So when, when, when Daniel speaks to foreign sense, looking at the energy aspect of water um, um, production and distribution, 
energy, energy in the Caribbean is not cheap. And therefore, building that resilience um, through the, the, the mitigation aspect in terms of energy efficiency, et cetera, is something that we need to look at and we can do that. Within the GCF, we do have a number of different windows. So you have the full funding um, project windows. You have the readiness pro, um, project that um, a couple of, of my colleagues already mentioned. Looking in, for instance, even within the readiness um, program, we have adaptation planning windows specifically. There's a $3 million window there. Um, luckily, I'm now seeing a greater appetite from the Caribbean region to access those resources, to build the necessary planning framework, to then be able to have the concept notes on adaptation that we want to come to the GC for the bigger funds. We do, and I, I know there was a, a conversation around, you know, the community level. How do we look at the vulnerable at the community level and bring the impact to them? So we do have some windows such as the simplified approval um, program, the enhanced direct access um, um, uh, modality that can, you know, look at targeting low risk from an environmental perspective projects, you know, projects that will not require for instance, significant amount of feasibility studies or environmental impact assessments that, you know, we're starting to build a risk profile, you know, we can use those windows to target in. I agree that there are challenges in terms of accessing um, resources. And I do agree that to some extent, when we say simplified access, it might not necessarily be simplified access for what countries and communities are looking for. But I think this is where we need to be having that dialogue to see how the GCF can make these processes even better so that entities such as the five C's, CDB, OECS can tap into our resources and bring it to scale. Because to date, we've only had one sub project, which is doing well, targeting 300,000 people in Haiti, looking at climate smart grids for rural communities. That, that is big um, resilience building in, 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 in a country like Haiti. And we have one enhanced direct access at, um, um, project that is in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, three Eastern Caribbean islands. So there is room for it. The question is, you know, how do we pull these projects together and come to, for instance, an entity like the Green Climate Fund and say, this is um, a window that we think is good for us as SIDS and we want to maximize it. So please work with us to make this window the best it can be for us as SIDS. So that is something that the GCF is very much willing to sit down and discuss. Thanks. Again. Chris, and right now, but we did start to say it. So I'm give, going to give you each one minute to say the last most critical thing that you need to say. Go ahead. Chris. Yes, please. I, I, didn't, I don't want to flog the water issue too much, but I just want to hone in on one aspect of infrastructure, which is the distribution systems. In some situations, you have um, you know, non-revenue water losses, 50 or more percent. Let's, let's assume you're looking at 60 percent, right, in, in a scenario. If you're able to cut that down to 20%, you actually can supply twice as many people as because you think of it, 40% is so only 40% is getting to be. If you cut it down to 20, that means you have 80% of the water. You can reach 20 twice as many people of households or consumers as you would have under your know, the, the business as usual scenario. And so that will have implications for your energy costs as well because you have you have to spend less money pumping. So targeting that aspect of it would actually help you both the the, the, the storage. And, and without having to necessarily build the amount of storage you think, right? And also in terms of the, the, the energy. So I just wanted to, to stop there. Very, very so, valid. So okay. Chair, I, I, I also just wanted to chime in a little bit on that, because I think the discussion has gone, you know, fairly comprehensive. Some persons have touched on the um, supply side, and now Chris is touching on this on the demand side, but I think more attention needs to be paid to the demand side as well. The issues of, of you know tariffs and water cons conservation, water use efficiencies, that's a big area which need we need to spend a lot of time. We need to get closer to the communities and you know help them to realize that yes, water, they might traditionally see water as a free gift, <laughs> but yes, it might be freely freely available but it's not free in terms of the, the resource, the impact of climate change on the resource to which Daniel uh, and, and, and um, Orville referred. It, it, it's certainly, it's becoming more demanding and more costly to, to maintain the level of services that, that we require. So more attention to the demand side as well. Thanks.
Thanks for that, Hopeton. I know we can't see Kiran or Isaac on the or Shante on the screen right now, but any closing remarks from any of the three of you at this point? Um, I welcome them very briefly, one minute. No pressure if there is none. Um, just to say, thank you, um, Janice. Just to say that, um, you know, I'm really pleased to see the progress that the region is now making in the area of disaster risk financing. Um, I, I would imagine uh, that the CRIF would have played some part in providing that, that tipping point. But I also think much of the work that the World Bank has been doing in that area has been very helpful. But even beyond just insurance, one of the areas that we are seriously looking at, in fact, we are just embarked on a consultancy to see how, what exactly can CRIF do to be able to broaden the spectrum of disaster risk financing. In other words, going outside of the current mandate to be able to adequately address the needs or help address the needs of the region in the area of disaster risk financing. We are really excited about this prospect. We are very, I mean, excited about doing a lot more to promote the work of CRIF as a disaster um, risk insurance facility, but more importantly, a development insurance entity. And we certainly look forward to the continued partnership with our members as well as the, the donor community. So thanks again for this opportunity. And thank you very much for being here. I really want to thank all of you. I know that we had our challenges today, but it happens, it is life. This is why we do what we do. We have to adapt, we have to be resilient. We had amazing speakers, thanks to all of you and to our audience. You were very, very patient and understanding with us today as we fought against our challenges. Thanks for your questions, which I posed to the audience. I hope we were able to at least kick off some ideas that you would want to, you know, maybe pursue some of these um, speakers in other forum and get further ideas or, or feedback from. Very importantly, the final session of this series is this afternoon at 1 p.m. At that session, you're going to hear from the USAID staff about the approaches that the agency is going to be taken to address climate change and that will be followed by the symposium closing. It will probably have some really powerful artistic um, presentation as we did at the opening, so you must join us. We're going to be sharing the link to that session in the chat right now, so do look for it and do access it, and we look forward to seeing you there. Please remain safe, and we look forward to seeing you this afternoon for our closing panel and ceremony. Thanks to my panelists. Thanks to our audience in Blue Jeans and at the UETV Facebook group. Have a fabulous Wednesday. Uh -huh.